Some films, especially PGs and stuff, are deliberately aimed at having moral stories, um, teaching kids right from wrong, etc. Big attempt to teach us family marriage um, values, but with really kind of twisted fantasy morals. Whatever the reason be, probably don't need to draw them too much away from it. You know, um, I don't ever walk away from the cinema thinking, oh, that's that's changed my life. Maybe subliminally, but I have to be honest. I wouldn't say there's a lot Hollywood. I don't say there's, there's lots of values, I mean, yeah, every really day. I mean, cinema, yeah, but I mean, not your average Hollywood film. Well, I don't know how much we learn, but there's an escape window into another world. You can learn lots about uh, American society, which is very interesting. They've got fantastic budgets, so you can do great things on fantasy and sci-fi and things like that, which are real escapism. Um, and lately they've been doing really sensitive character films and family studies and things like that. So some Hollywood's managed to be very moving again. Uh, which I think is good because it uh, stirs the emotions. I'd probably take more away from a history lesson. It definitely influences people how to act in society. Uh, in Hollywood films, the values you learn are uh, just to be kind to everyone. <laughs> As a child, I'd rather watch a film, but I, I don't think I'd take away the lesson I should be taking away. This research video aims to discover whether mainstream popular culture film has the ability to educate its consumers about the educational values of life in order to help their development. It will firstly provide evidence of embedded values within two case studies, Harry Potter and Mean Girls. It will then investigate the narrative origins and techniques used to communicate the values before concluding upon its success. Harry Potter is based on the seven novels by J.K. Rowling. The eight successful films have made an estimated combined box office value of $2,390,076,596. The, the story follows the journey of an orphaned boy named Harry Potter who discovers he's a famous wizard at the age of 11. Faced with the return of Lord Voldemort, Harry must team up with his best friends, Ron Weasley and Hermione Granger, to defeat evil and protect those he loves. Mean Girls is based on the book Queen Bees and Wannabes, written by Rosalind Wiseman. The film made an estimated box office value of $86,058,055. The film presents a female homeschool teenager called Katie Harron, who is enrolled at an American high school by her parents on their return from Africa. Having never had any public school experience, Katie tries to make friends and fit in, but gets caught up in girl rivalry. Probably a lot of people who've read the Harry Potter books or watched all the films might not have consciously clocked it. Um, that, for example, Malfoy's in particular, um, I mean, the Death Eaters in general, I think the Death Eaters in general are clearly referring to kind of the Nazis in Germany and around wartime. And the kind of Aryan ideal of pure pure bloodness is directly referring to that, and um, the Death Eaters kind of campaign to stamp out the Muggles and and um, half bloods is a direct reference to that kind of wanting to create a, a pure lineage. How dare you talk to me, you filthy little mudblood! <laughs> I think it's I think it's to her credit actually J.K. Rowling that um, she's embedded it in the story enough that you can kind of experience the the horror of what it's like to to really look at that kind of very scary um, totalitarian kind of um, prejudice that is so kind of righteous that it's willing to kill people. For for its belief, because they're you know they're uh, dirtying up the uh, DNA pool, so I think Malfoys are a very direct reference. Yeah, Lucius and Malfoy are are very very Aryan in their look, aren't they? With the sort of blonde ha blonde hair, blue eyes look. Um, so I think I do think that is I think that's a very clear direct reference to that. And it was always going to be a quest really to um to avenge them but to avenge everyone against this this creature this being who believes that he can make himself immortal by killing other people.
I think we all understand what an act of evil is, and Voldemort qualifies extravagantly for acts of evil. He's killed cold-bloodedly, sometimes for enjoyment, um, and for his own personal gain. Regarding prejudice, the thing is, in our society in the West, <clears throat> which is all I can really talk about because it's all I know, we, we kind of fixate on very simplistic handles of, of, of identity. So, somebody's gay, then they become a gay actor, or they become a gay uh, part in the film. Um, somebody's black, they become the black person in the film. Somebody's black and gay, they become the gay black person in the film. The fact that they might be the smartest brain surgeon on the planet or nice to their kids or you know lots of other things that could be going on for them as a character in in real life or f or in fictitious worlds kind of gets overshadowed by very simplistic things i mean i think a lot of our tv film industry is obsessed with sex and sexiness so if you're a pretty girly then you get the pretty girly parts if you're a hunky bloke you get the hunky bloke parts and then that kind of overshadows everything else so i think it was an incredibly smart thing to do and i think again this is one of jk rowling's great successes as a writer she clearly had an overview and a big picture plan and left little hansel and gretel seed trails around the place but there's so much going on that you forget that they're there and then you find something out later and then when you look back it's like all oh, right yeah that makes sense now but i i think that's a really wonderful way to do it i think if dumbledore had been the gay headmaster from book one it had just been a distraction because why why is it significant and um there's a, there's only kind of one inference to um another wizard that he was very close to that kind of when you look back on it you sort of think all oh, right maybe they were a, a couple rather than just mates but it's like so what and i think that's i think that's um i think that's how it should be you know right so he was gay all right so what what difference does that make i think that's a cleverer way to do it than if making a big deal out of it how dare you defy your masters Dobby has no master. Dobby is a free elf. And Dobby has come to save Harry Potter and his friends. Dobby is a house servant slash slave. So we're into slavery as an issue. And when you're into slavery as an issue, I mean, that's a whole other ball game, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've forgotten in our history Personally, I think in this country, we, we're very um, xenophobic as a nation. We, 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 we kind of, we're not very welcoming to people from other countries into our country. And we have all, a lot of sort of nationalist issues around nicking our jobs and they need to learn our culture and blah, 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 blah seemingly forgetting the fact that only 150 years before we galloped around the planet taking over countries because we felt like it and bringing back loads of people as slaves to serve our every whim i mean we're one of the worst countries in the world culturally for the damage that we did with the slave trade and i and i think it's another good reminder in that sort of sub subliminal subconscious way with dobby as a character to see that kind of relationship between a character that just wants to serve selflessly and um, I don't think most people in today's age probably have an experience of anything like that it's kind of the closest you might have to it is your pet dying or something like that so I mean Dobby as a character when Dobby dies I mean it he's been instrumental in moving things along in a good way and served purpose 
and it's sad you know it's a sad it's a sad character death in the plot line but i think slavery along with fascism uh and you know and totalitarianism are things in our collective history that deserve kind of reminding us of in a subtle way like that it's powerful isn't it so if you're from africa why are you white oh my god karen you can't just ask people why they're white the comparison with mean girls and harry potter the thing about stereotypes is it's a very broad brush way of painting a character uh, what Mean Girls is particularly brilliant at is is creating these little pools and tribes. Here, this map is going to be your guide to North Shore. Now, where you sit in the cafeteria is crucial because you got everybody there. You got your freshmen, ROTC guys, preps, JV jocks, Asian nerds, cool Asians, varsity jocks, unfriendly black hotties. Girls who eat their feelings. Girls who don't eat anything. Desperate wannabes. Burnouts. Sexually active band geeks. The greatest people you will ever meet. And the worst. Beware of the plastic. Is it the case in real life that the nerdy lad with specs who's good at science and maths and probably hasn't had a girlfriend at 16, is it the case that they're always going to be rubbish at football? Well, maybe it is, but not necessarily, because that is a stereotype, isn't it, that a certain kind of character that seems to be a certain way, a whole bunch of other stuff is stuck to them. That's what a stereotype is. It's a, it's a cliche. It's a generalisation. But I would say that a cliche is always a cliche because there's quite a lot of truth in it. That's why it becomes a cliche. The good thing about stereotypes, there's a lot of negative things about stereotypes, but the good thing about them is if you throw somebody a type that they recognise, they don't really question it. It just kind of goes into the mix of like, oh yeah, they're the, the punky goth, sulky, emo one, shoegazer, or yeah, they're the pretty bitchy girl, or I think that's, it's a strategic thing that sh she did in the, in the book that the film's based on, um, that allows you to, mo to move like chess pieces around in a game. It allows you to move things around in the film plot that takes the audience w with it and allows you to kind of embed other things underneath it that if you, it's like the, the, other, the other extreme is like drugs or sex education, which most of the time, in my experience, is very clumsy. And so when you try and make a big deal out of something like, all drugs are bad, don't do them, then it just becomes boring and a, a moral lecture. And there's no bigger turn off than somebody waving a finger at you, telling you what to do or what not to do. Don't have sex, because you will get pregnant and die. Don't have sex in the missionary position. Don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it, promise? Okay, everybody take some rubbers. And I think that is really the success of Mean Girls and Harry Potter is it just drops nice little things into the mix for your subconscious to just kind of go, right, okay, that's not a very nice way to behave. And who knows, maybe later on somebody who might have bullied someone doesn't or might have judged someone by their colour or their sexuality doesn't. I mean, who knows? That's, that's a difficult thing to prove, but I certainly think it's a, it's a good attempt to do something like that and I think it's got a lot of value in our society if popular culture can but then you know the question is but well, who decides what's good and what's not and what's worthwhile and what's not i mean i can say that i think that's a good idea but that's because i'm a sort of punky hippie liberal you know somebody some conservative kind of hard liner might say that's just ridiculous what they'll need is a good slap around the head well, I think, it, I think Mean Girls compared to Harry Potter is more, well, it's more realistic because Harry Potter obviously is, is, a, is a fantasy and, and the, 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 the advantage that Harry Potter's got is it is not trying to look real because it's a fantasy, so it can, it can do anything. It can, it can make up any, I mean, things like the, um, what's the, what's the, 
the Thestrals that you can only see if you've experienced death. I mean, that's fantastic. What a genius idea, because anybody who's experienced death or seen a dead person knows that you are, you are different afterwards. And to have a creature that you can only see if you've experienced death, oh, that's really clever. But what does that mean? I mean, that's just some kind of fantasy idea. I think what's m the strength that Mean Girls has got is that anybody who's been to high school knows there's the cool kids and the nerdy kids and the anonymous ones that nobody notices and they know which category they fitted into and that's like an easily recognisable real life map that you can put a story into that yeah makes sense doesn't it but death is on virtually every other page of the harry potter books you know the, 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 at least half of harry's journey is, is a journey to um deal with death in its many forms what it does to the living what it means to die um what what survives death Understanding what film is used for helps identify its goals. The Motion Picture Association of America states that the film should be used for entertainment purposes only, which compromises the way spectators consume a film, meaning they do not consciously look for messages. Cinema is arguably the 20th century's most influential art form. Its artists told stories across national boundaries, in as many languages, genres and philosophies as one can imagine. Indeed, it is hard to find a subject that film has yet to tackle. During the last decade, we've seen a vast integration of global media, now dominated by a culture of the Hollywood blockbuster. We are increasingly offered a diet in which sensation, not story, is king. Considering both films are based upon novels which present the ideologies of the writer, these must be reproduced within the film as they are embedded in the narrative that if changed would affect the story, compromising audience enjoyment. I, I'm not pushing any belief system here, although there is a lot of Christian imagery in the books. That's undeniable. Mm -hmm. And certainly in Hallows, there's a very clear... Correct. But that's not... Um, that's an allusion to a belief system in which I was raised. I wrote Queen Bees and Wannabes because I've been working with boys and girls for years. And I would do these parent coffees, orientations that parents go to, you know, two people come. But, you know, <laughs> or they used to come, now more people come. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I would go to these parent coffees and orientations. And at the end of these, pr of these programs, parents would come up to me and say just like their kids do you know like a girl will come up to me after a class all the time or an assembly or a presentation and say um, Rosalind can I talk to you for a second and they want to tell me about some really you know difficult problem that they're, that they're dealing with and after I was doing these parent orientations the parents would come up to me and say exactly the same thing you know Rosalind can I talk to you for a second and then they would tell me about how helpless they felt and how they totally didn't get the world of their daughter and I wanted to just write everything I possibly could for those parents. And so I said, this is everything I think that you should know about what the world looks like to your daughter. <laughs> it's very easy for adults to forget what it was like to, you know, when they were in sixth grade, in seventh grade, in eighth grade, or their, you know, their teen years, and for them to, you know, look at it sort of in a superficial way. Oh, it's a rite of passage, it's no big deal. You know, people treating you like dirt every day, it's not a big deal, don't worry about it, you'll get through it, you'll be fine, no problem. You won't even remember. Well, the problem is, is, it, is that it actually is a big deal because it teaches you really important things. One of the reasons Harry Potter is so full of idealized father figures, Hagrid, Dumbledore, and Sirius Black, is that Jo's relationship with her own father was far from ideal. But that's the perennial appeal of magic, the idea that we ourselves have power and we can shape our world. I want the movie to get girls talking that love is, is the most powerful thing of all. And I remember thinking that, um, I've, I'm about to make myself cry, but I remember thinking that when 9-11 happened, mm. because those last phone calls were all about the last thing, knowingly that I'm, I'm going to say on this earth is I love you. Mm -hmm. What's more powerful than that? What, what's more proof than that? Beyond fear, beyond death. 
Some theories suggest that the characters themselves are responsible for delivering messages. Vladimir Prop proposes that characters' roles originate from the fairy tale model, which is known for its moral endings, and therefore suggests that film is simply a development upon this tool. Irvine Goffman Theories such as Eric Byrne's transactional analysis proposes that messages are communicated through a psychological process of behaviour and parental relationship, meaning that films need to encourage communication between parent and child for their values to be fully received and understood. The act of film consumption has become a popular routine with our current culture. Therefore, more films are being consumed, thus needing to ensure that the film is having an appropriate effect on our minds, especially younger ones. Having looked at two case studies, there is clear evidence to suggest that popular culture films are loaded with intent, but they are not always understood. The national curriculum allocates the education of values within PSHE and citizenship, which becomes non-mandatory from the academic year 10. Therefore, film can act as a tool for continual learning in this subject, in which case children should be taught how to efficiently read and understand visual texts from a young age without taking a film study course so they are able to utilise film to its full potential not only as a source of entertainment but for knowledge and support. It's about any, any kind of totalitarian opinion that becomes so kind of self-righteous that it's willing to stamp people out in the pursuit of what it wants. I think it's quite hard for us to imagine that in the West in our comfortable lifestyles that that could ever happen to us. I, I think that's really difficult for us to imagine. And I think where J.K. Rowling succeeded is that she's enabled people to imagine something truly horrific that they probably have never experienced in their everyday life, albeit in a fantasy manner. I think that sort of plants the seeds for people to maybe... I mean, who knows? Who knows? whether reading Harry Potter and watching all the films makes somebody less prone to prejudice or bullying or, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, who knows? That's a very difficult thing to say. But I certainly think it can't do any harm to drop that kind of stuff into people's consciousnesses and doing it in a popular cultural form that's entertaining that the whole family can see in particular. I think that's uh, Harry Potter's greatest strength is mum, dad, teenagers kids can all sit down and watch the same thing and chat about it. I think that's really, really rare. So I think that's, um, I can't do any harm in the world. Medicine is anything that is trying to do something useful or good in the world. And I think Harry Potter and Mean Girls are, are medicine media. They're embedding a useful liberalist morality into popular culture in a way that I personally think can't do any harm. Purists may feel that fiction dissipates the quest of real human understanding, that film is too crude to tell a complex and detailed history, or that filmmakers always serve drama over truth. But within the reels lie purpose and meaning. As one 12 year old said after watching Wizard of Oz, every person should watch this because unless you do, you may not know that you too have a heart. We honour reading, why not honour watching with the same passion? Consider Citizen Kane as valuable as Jane Austen. Agree that Boys in the Hood, like Tennyson, offers an emotional landscape and a heightened understanding that work together each a piece of memorable art, each a brick in the wall of who we are. And it's okay if we remember Tom Hanks better than astronaut Jim Lovell, or have Ben Kingsley's face superimposed onto that of Gandhi's, and though not real, Eve Harrington, Howard Beale, Mildred Pierce, are an opportunity to discover what it is to be human.